All right, you have your word? Oh, yeah. Open it up to Acts chapter 17, please. And uh, we're going to just pick up right where I left off last week. And uh, it's really, the, the topic is Holy Spirit and just knowing God at a deeper level. And I'm not, that's never going to get old. We're always going to want to know him more. We're going to want to strip away our flesh, strip away the carnal nature, ask the Lord to take over, he said, to crucify our flesh daily. And I was talking about last week how Paul was just so bold. And as he went on his missionary journey, he would go into city after city, go into the temple, and, and, and just try to convince people that Jesus was the Messiah, the very one that they were waiting for. He started with the Jews. He started where he knew he would get the most opposition. And time after time, Thessalonica, Berea, each city that he went to, people were persuaded, but there was also major opposition. So we left off last week where they moved him all the way down to Athens, which was 140 miles away. And those people weren't going to chase him that far. But he said when he got to that city, he was grieved in his spirit because of the idolatry. Anybody can relate? In our culture today, you can feel grieved by the idolatry. And, and it's just so, you know, you just want to, want to shake somebody and say, why can't you see it? Jesus is the answer. Accept the Lord. Let him be the governor of your life. Let him be the king of your domain of your life. Take on his lordship and you'll receive the blessing of Holy Spirit to come in your life and that, that power source from heaven can live right inside of you. And in, in verse 22, he's standing before a court on what's called Mars Hill, the Oropagus. It's right next to the Acropolis. If you remember the picture I showed last week, he's on a granite hill. And he's looking up at the Acropolis, and he's on trial. And, and they think he's trying to claim that Jesus should be the new king, the secular king, which would be against the law. And he's saying, no, it's the king of your heart. Amen? I love that song, king of my heart, right? Yeah. That's who he is for us. And he's talking to these, you know, pretty intellectual, heady people that are surrounded by idols, just like we are in our culture here. We're surrounded by idols. And as we are his ambassadors, we shine forth with that spirit of God on the inside of us and people see something different about us. Amen? You could see it on Chuck on Friday night when he was speaking, even the lights, some of the pictures that were taken. There was a glow. It was so cool. That, that's for all of us, right? Anybody who's a Christian, we have that same power source on the inside of us. And he said, look, I see that you people are very... Uh, I was fascinated with all the shrines that I came across, and I found one that was inscribed to the God that nobody knows. <laughs> and I want everybody that's listening to say, you can know the unknown God. <laughs> that's right. Tell everybody you know. You don't know his name, but we do. We met him, and he's real. And Paul said, I'm going to introduce you to him today. <laughs> that statue that you have, I'm here to introduce you to this God so you can worship intelligently and know who you're dealing with. He made the entire human race and made each, I'm sorry, made the earth hospitable so that we would just seek after God and not grope around in the darkness, but actually find him. And so many people in COVID have been shaken to their roots and their foundation that they saw the things they were trusting in were temporary. And Jesus said, you better build your house on the rock because the storm will come. And if you're not built on the rock, it's gonna all fall away. And that's why people are in such distress right now. They don't, they're not going to the true source of life. They're going after counterfeits. So what better role could we have than to shine that light and let them see something different about us? It's intangible to them, but we say, no, you can know tangibly the intangible God. The Greeks called him the unknown God. Paul said, I'm here to introduce you to him because he's near. And then in Deuteronomy, Moses said, what God? What nation has a God that's so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call to him? He didn't choose you to be a people because you were the most in number. He chose you to be a treasured possession. This is Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. He chose you to be a people, his treasured possession, not because you were more in number than any other people. The Lord set his love on you because you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because he loved you, not based on your credentials. How many know you're loved by the Lord today? Unconditionally. I've been counseling with somebody 
and you know, we taught him some of the basic principles. And, and this week I texted him just to check up on him and he said, you know, uh, that performance lie keeps trying to kick me back down again. And the revelation came to him that he's not loved just because he can perform well. He's loved intrinsically by God because he's a son of God. And you remember, that takes a little while to get a hold of that one, doesn't it? That's spiritual warfare coming against you. And then all of us know the verse from Psalm 23. We've heard it so many times. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You are with me. That's why we don't fear, because we know he's with us. A very present help in time of trouble. Right? I know you're with me, Lord. Even if I don't see you, even if I don't sense you, we sing it in that song. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You're the way maker. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, right here next to me. Your kingdom is available to me. Isaiah 43, we used to sing it. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. I'm with you. He's with you right now. Not far away, right here. Very present help. And then in Psalm 145, 18, it says, The Lord is near to all who call on him. Near. That's the thing I want to keep getting through to you. There's so many verses. Psalm 46 says, There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. So again, just put your hands on your belly right here and say, thank you, Lord, that you're inside of me. I'm the temple of your Holy Spirit. And that living water's inside of me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Make yourself real. Out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water because we serve a God who loves us. He's near to us. That very present help, not distant God, ready to strike us down angry. No, in love with us, like Adriel said today, he left heaven, he left the perfection of heaven for the joy that was set before him was Joe Bellata. <laughs> you can't see him right now, but I got a double thumbs up for that one. David referred to the Holy Spirit in an unusual way because he had sinned. Right? They had a different relationship with Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And in Psalm 51, which is the psalm of repentance after his sin with Bathsheba, verse 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Yeah. Right? We, we can so relate to that when we feel like we've missed the mark, when, when we still sin as a Christian and we know it because we get convicted sometimes. And David says, Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. And then he says, cast not away your presence from me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. And we wouldn't say that today, would we? I hope you wouldn't. I don't want you to think that this is a temporary relationship. Holy Spirit is inside of you. We just don't want to grieve him, right? Because we're in a different dispensation. I want to talk about that a little bit more today. Ezekiel talked about it as well in the Old Testament. The promise was, I will remove a heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So right on the inside of us, we carry the presence of God. We don't want to grieve him. We want to cultivate our relationship with him. We want to be in constant contact with the Holy Spirit inside of us. There's not one thing that we do that he's not interested in helping us with. Jump over to the New Testament in John chapter 7. It says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stands up and cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. What a picture for us. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you have Holy Spirit? Yes, yeah, so out of your belly flows rivers of living water. This is why he said, guard your gate, guard your heart, watch what goes in and watch what comes out. It shouldn't be, James said, that we're double-minded. Out of the same fountain doesn't come fresh water and salt water. So we shouldn't also have blessings and cursings coming out of the same place. The spirit of God has to rule, not our flesh that wants to rise back up again. No, it gets put down daily. <laughs> And then he said about the spirit, uh, John is letting us know in verse 39, that river that he's referring to, in case we weren't sure, he says, he said this about the spirit, 
That word is pneuma, which means breath. That's what the devil's been contending for over COVID is our breath. But God, right at the beginning, he breathed into Adam and he gave him life. Jesus breathed into the apostles in the upper room and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you see the new Genesis? Jesus comes and he defeats death. And now, just as God breathed on Adam, Jesus breathes on the apostles to show them the symbolism of it. John said, I bore witness. I saw the spirit. This is John the Baptist talking about his cousin, Jesus. He said, I actually saw the spirit, that breath of God. I saw it come down, descend from heaven like a dove and remain on him. That's the pneuma. But there's another attribute I want to talk about. We've got a little bit of time left. Um, we're just, again, we're going to honor our, our, our hosts here, right? Because there's another service going on for the sisters that live on the campus here. And we promised them we'd be done before 11 today. When we go out into the other part, the pavilion, we'll have more time. And there won't be, you know, it won't, we won't have to start at 9 o'clock, just so you know, in case anybody was wondering about that. Somebody clapping for that? Yes, okay. <laughs> Crucify that flesh. <laughs> Yeah, no, so we won't have any restrictions. We'll probably start at 10, and we can go as long as we want over there. Amen? So, but today we just, again, they, they work with us. We want to work with them. That's how it works. They're lovers of hospitality. We want to love the people that are hospitable to us. <laughs> so then that scene that I just mentioned, when Jesus appears to them in the upper room, they're praying. They're afraid. They're afraid the Romans are to come after them because the Romans would know that they were followers of Christ. Jesus has been crucified and Mary told them that, that she saw the resurrected Christ, and they weren't so sure about that, right? So he walks into the room, and he says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So look at the person next to you and say, As the Father sent Jesus, so Jesus is sending you. So take a hike. No, just kidding. <laughs> No, it will be more like, go ye. So go ye, therefore, into all the world and preach the gospel. The good news that the kingdom of God is not distant and far away. He's right here. He's next to you. He's available. But you have to surrender to his lordship to gain access. Unless you're born again, Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom. And unless you're born again, unless you experience that rebirth, you can't enter into the kingdom that's available to you now. Not just when we die and go to heaven. It's that kingdom now. When we pray for people, we're saying, Lord, your kingdom come. There's no sickness in heaven. Your kingdom come on this person. Open heavens over our lives that you would move mightily and defeat this disease that's trying to ruin this person's life right now. They will live and declare the glory of God. We'll know the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So he breathes on them and says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. So God breathes on Adam. Jesus breathes on the disciples. But while Jesus was still in the tomb, he was a dead body, right? You believe that? Yeah. Believe he was fully dead, right? So God somehow breathed life back into him. So he comes walking out of the tomb, this new version of Christ that's able to now breathe that breath of life on us. And he says, look, it's even better for you if I go away. Because then the Lord, the Father, can baptize all of humanity with that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I'm breathing you on you now in the upper room symbolically to show you what's going to happen to all mankind, right? That's God's way of saying amen. <laughs> Ruach. But then there's another word for advocate. And that's really what I want to just focus the time on. It's not just the breath of God. It's called comforter. It's called helper. There's a convicting power of Holy Spirit, right? He's the one that, that acts as that guard on your behavior when you're not sure, when you feel like you're being tempted. Here he comes again. <laughs> yes, sir. All kind of extra effects outside. I love it. I'm not in this alone. He kept trying to tell them, look, I'm telling you that I'm leaving and you're sad, but I'm really not leaving you because I'm going to give you my spirit after I go. So it's actually a good thing that I go. And when we're together like this, we encourage one another. 
And that's why the devil works so hard to keep the church separated, to keep us apart, to get us downcast. Because, yeah, I went to church, but it wasn't the same with the mask on and all the other things. But we're not giving in to that, are we? You cannot allow that fire to go out on the inside. When the devil pushes you, you push back. Say, no, I don't have to back down to the bully. That's, his, that's all he's got is fear and intimidation. There's no, there's no authority in his, in his fear. His only power is lies. So the only power is something you give him by believing a lie. And let's just cancel the power of lies over our life right now and say, Lord, renew my mind. Like David, create that new spirit in me. Recreate it. Wherever the devil has yanked me down, I say no. Last week we said we serve an anti-gravity God. Gravity's trying to pull us down, but there's an incredible force of lift that lifts us above the fear. So this is what he said, Jesus in John 14. He said, I'm going to ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate, another helper, another comforter. All right, but... If you think of comforter as what you do with a child when, when they're wanting to go to sleep, this is different. This is no, this is the comfort you need when you're a soldier in the battle and you're stepping out of that boat on Normandy and the, and the bullets are flying and you're going to take that beach. You need courage. And that's what comfort is in this sense. It's an advocate. It's like an attorney who's representing you and, and also telling the opponent why the lie is not going to work because your advocate knows the truth. So th this, is the, this is the prophetic act. Just put your arm out next to you and say, thank you, Lord, for being right here with me <laughs> and for being my advocate. And sometimes you pat me on the head <laughs> and sometimes you have to kick me in the butt. <laughs> and I give you permission to do that in love. <laughs> Right? Because if they're really your advocate, they're going to tell you when you're going astray as well. Sometimes that's even more valuable than the encouraging word because it prevents you from going off into the ditch. So an advocate does both. It brings conviction, but it also brings defense to us. And nobody else can do this for you but you. But you can increase the odds of following Jesus at a higher level of maturity if you're connected to mature Christians. And that's why Easter quoted it early, forsake not the assembling together with other believers. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here because you're here, and it's pretty nice, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you might want to bring your fly swatter next week, or you might want to bring a little spray. I don't know what you do to kill bugs, but I'm not going to be that guy that's complaining. If we're inside, I complain about the mask. If I'm outside, I'm complaining about the bugs. Like, when am I ever going to be happy, right? <laughs> Somebody said, well, if I didn't eat enough protein today, maybe, I'll, never mind. <laughs> Part of why we get confused of other people not understanding what we're saying is, Jesus went on to say the world won't receive this advocate because they can't see him or know him. But you know him intimately because he will make his home in you and will live inside of you. I promise, John 14, 18, Jesus says, I promise I will never leave you helpless or abandon you as orphans. I will come back to you. Now that, some people look only to mean the second coming. In the, in the context here, he's saying, no, when my spirit comes, I'm going to be coming back to you. So you have Jesus inside of you through his Holy Spirit. Cultivate that relationship. And then in verse 23 of John 14, he said, My Father will love you so deeply that we will come to you and make our dwelling place. The Father didn't send me to speak my own revelation, but the words of the Father. I'm telling you those while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the Spirit of holiness, the one who, like me, sets you free. I love that one. The one like me who sets you free. It's got a nice ring to it, doesn't it? The one like me that sets you free. That's who's living on the inside of us. He'll teach you all things in my name. John chapter 1. A lot of you know it. might have been the first chapter you read when you became a Christian. It says he entered into the, the world he created, yet the world was unaware. He came to the very people that he created, to those who should have recognized him, but they did not receive him. But those who embraced him, love that picture, embracing him, 
It's not tolerating him. It's embracing him. It's saying, Lord, I need more of you. Eat, he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. I'm the, new, I'm the new meal. I'm the food. Right? Remember he told his disciples, my meat is to do the will of the one who sent me. Let him be our food. Let him be our nourishment. Those who embraced him and took hold of his name were given authority to become the children of God. And we sang this this morning when we sang, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. And that first verse says, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the whole universe displayed. But David then said, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you would pay any attention to us? And that's when you need to say who we are in Christ, our beloved children of a loving father. That's what is man that you are mindful? We are made in your image and we are your sons and daughters. And you're a living God. So it's a little confusing. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I'm going to end here in Psalm 8. David said, you, you, you whose splendor, your praise is celebrated over all the heavens out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. You remember this? Jesus quotes it in the New Testament. So David is trying to capture the fact that what is man that you are so mindful of him when we're so small and you're so big, and yet out of the mouth of a baby, an infant, as they're gurgling, with that speech, the breath of God that's on the inside of, of them came from you, and that's as much of a miracle as what we look at in the, in the heavens. So that's a reason that we should really not disrespect other people, because everyone, no matter of the color, race, education level, how much money they have, everyone, every human being, even the opposing political party, whatever you think that is, they're made in God's image. And if you want to see them change, ask God to help you. <laughs> Don't try to do it in your own flesh. He loves them. Do you? <laughs> Selah. So your splendor, your radiance, your praise is known in the heavens and even down to the mouth of an infant baby because the breath inside of them came from you. We got both ends of it. What is man, verse 4, that you are mindful of him? So I'm going to end in Matthew 21 verse 12 it says Jesus came to the temple and he drove out all those who were buying and selling I'm guessing you all know the reference here right he overturned the tables of the money changers and he said in this version it says he upended the money changers tables and the dove sellers benches people would come from far away and they would have different currency and they wanted to make a sacrifice so they would have to buy the offering and they were getting ripped off by people right in the temple. Jesus said, it's a den of thieves. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. And you made it a den of thieves. And, and what happens if somebody comes and they don't have enough money to buy the offering? Are you going to allow them in? And they weren't. So even in that regard, they weren't honoring other people. They were treating people on a scale. That's not what God says to do, is it? And he's upset. These are the very people that should have known better. And he said, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer for all people, but you've turned this house of prayer into a den of robbers. Wow. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. Can you say that? In the temple. In the they weren't allowed in because they couldn't bring the sufficient sacrifice. But with Jesus in authority, everybody has entrance. Yeah. And everybody gets healed. He healed them right on the spot. That's what's supposed to happen when we come together. Yeah. You never know that encouraging word you give somebody, what a, what a life-giving thing that could mean. You never know when you're praying and God gives you an impression what that means to them right. deep down on the inside that they might not even ever share with you. But God knows the right message at the right time. You are the right gift at the right time for that person who you're praying for. So then it says, the blind and the lame came to the temple. Jesus healed them. And the rings of children circled around and they sang, Hosanna to the son of David. Yeah. These are these little children. 
But the priests and the scribes didn't understand when they saw the upturned tables, the walking paralytics, the singing children. They were shocked and indignant and angry because they did not understand. The children got the revelation before the religious people. Say la. Let's not be rigid people. Let's not be so religious that we think we can fit them in our little box. Amen? Holy Spirit's got to reveal to us the little children should not have more understanding than us. But the purity of their heart caused them to recognize what David was saying out of the mouths of babes and infants. They understand it more than our over-intellectualizing. And we're in part of the country here where that's been a big problem. If you want to listen to Ken Fish, the interview we did with Ken Fish, I really encourage you to do that. Princeton's not that far from here, and, and that's where the doctrine of cessationism came. And We really should just, let's just stand and, and reverse the curse of that thinking that Holy Spirit is no longer available to people today. And let's just stand in proxy. I'm not saying the people were wrong. I'm just saying they were confused. The people who came up with that idea that Holy Spirit is not for today, that was, they were not hearing from God. They were, they were drawing a conclusion that because they weren't seeing the Holy Spirit in operation, that he, might not, he must not be around anymore. But that's a big mistake, right? How many have been touched by the Holy Spirit in a supernatural way? So you have had the experience. But if other people haven't, you need to just give them your testimony and say it's real. He's alive. It's real. Just because you haven't seen it yet doesn't mean it's not real. So, Lord, just lift your hands. Would you just say, Lord, we, we repent on behalf of those people. You don't have to repeat after me, but just agree with me in prayer. We repent on behalf of the people not too far from here who wrote the books like counterfeit miracles that, that grieved you, Holy Spirit. And we say, reverse the curse. We repent. We repent on behalf of those people that brought that demonic doctrine into the earth that said that you're not real and that you don't still do miracles. And we ask you to have mercy on us. Let your mercy triumph over judgment because we welcome you, Holy Spirit, we welcome you onto this property right now into the domain of our lives, of our human earthly life, which we know is just going to be for a limited time until you come back. But while we're here, Lord, we will go ye. We will be those people, like you said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Like we said earlier, Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, so that we can clearly get the downloads that you want to give us. And help us bring credibility to the truth of the Word of God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. As you did miracles in the New Testament, you're still doing them today. And Lord, we count it a great privilege that you would use us, that you would extend your power through us as conduits. And we just say, increase your presence, Lord. We welcome an increase of your presence in our lives to move through us, to see lives shifted, people healed, confused minds come to their senses. And Lord, we want to, we want to, just see the devil on the run. You came to destroy the works of the devil. We are here to fulfill that promise, Lord, to be your ambassadors in the earth, not with words of flowery language, but in the demonstration of the power of God. And Lord, we pray it in Jesus' name right now. Come on, one more time, just say, Lord, you're welcome here in my heart. I ask you for more of you and less of me. Increase your power flow through me. Mm. Go ahead. So um, when uh, my husband was just closing in prayer, I just saw a couple of things that I want to release. Since we, we're going to just release corporate healings here because, right, you know, we're still restricted about laying hands on people. But I saw two things. I saw, and my husband was saying it, that God wants to heal stony hearts he wants to heal hard hearts and it's not that you know you know when you think of that at least when i think of that i think of rebellion and things like that but this is where you know you're not you're just so caught up in the natural not looking to what god can do supernaturally so can we just lay hands on our heart and just say lord soften my heart 
And Lord, where there's been, where I've had a hard heart, I repent. Help me to see in the realm of the spirit and not limit you. And I thank you, Lord, for freedom and that you you're removing scar tissue from my heart. The other thing I saw now a physical healing, I saw an artery being healed in in somebody's heart. And uh, so if you that's you, you have any kind of heart issues, lay hands on yourself. And uh, so, Lord, I just speak to anyone battling with any kind of heart issues, any AFib, uh, you know, um, blocked arteries or whatever. Lord, I, we just loose your healing presence. Father, your word says that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, we are healed in Jesus' name. And the other thing, and if anyone else has a word of knowledge, just come on up. But the other thing I saw was uh, I heard the Lord say that there's, there could be more than one and maybe on uh, those who are watching. If you're believing God to move, the Lord says to go ahead. There's an open door for you. And to not look at restrictions, but the, God, the Lord says that there is an open door for you in this season to move forward in that in Jesus' name. Amen. I kept hearing the word sciatica. I don't even quite know what that means. <laughs> I think it's something with the back. So we just thank you, Father. Just lay your hand, for anyone that's speaking to, lay your hands on, your, on that area. Or any kind of back issue. Yes, Pastor Tricia. Any kind of back issue. And we just speak healing over that back right now. We command all pain to go, all inflammation to go. Any kind of um, neural pathways, I'm just seeing them pinched. You are being released right now in Jesus' name. We release the healing power of Holy Spirit over you right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus, for our healing. The other word I was hearing was mania. Um, people who may be suffering from bipolar, uh, depression, anxiety. Um, we just take authority right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we release the blood of Jesus on our minds and on our spirits. And we take authority over that spirit that says we'll always be dependent on medication. Father, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the healer. You are the one that regulates us mind, body, and spirit. So we say to that spirit of mental health that's trying to, uh, it's just trying to just that's destroy our future that's trying to confuse us we take authority over that spirit of confusion in the mind and we command it to loose its hold right now in Jesus name alright I just want to speak a blessing we got it one more time if you can lift your hands you know it because we sing it the Lord bless you and keep you Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Say, I receive it. I receive it. All right, praise the Lord. Love you.